Uh, well, tell you what, we're going to need all of our time together in the Word of God. Make sure you take out your Bibles, take out the handout sheet that was given to you at the front door. If you're watching online, always make sure that you uh, open up the app. You can follow along with us, take some notes, get the fill in the blank there. We are in part six of our series, Walking Through the Gospel of Mark. The series is called The Greatest Opportunity. And today's message is entitled, God is Doing a New Thing. So I got a question for you as we begin. Is being skeptical, analytical, is that a good thing or a bad thing? No. <laughs> right? I mean, the answer is yeah, right? Because here's the deal, pros and cons. So I, I'm, anal I'm analytical, right? I look through the systems. I look through logic. And, and as a teacher, I always try to check foundation bases and, and kind of build up from there. That's, that's how I think. I don't think that's, that's good or bad. I think it's how I, how I use it. So the good stuff is that anything you ever tell me, anything I hear on the radio, anything I hear on TV, uh, no matter what, anything I hear goes through a filtering system. The filtering system basically is it's try, I'm trying to find out truth. I'm trying to find out, does it resonate with what I know about God? Does it resonate with God's word? Stuff like that. Because really, that's the only thing that matters to me in this life. Uh, personal opinion is helpful, but I can't ultimately rely on it. I actually need the word of God in order to do that. So I'm always listening. Now, my filter may be broken, but I feel uh, it's necessary for me to kind of do what the Bible says, is kind of test all spirits and figure out what's good and toss out the bad and keep what is good, right? Right? Um, where it goes bad is when I just become critique-minded. You know what I mean? Where you're just critical of other people and other things. Like, imagine, imagine this. Imagine your job is to be a pastor, and then you got to go to a church somewhere. You are so analytical on everything. Man, it's what they're saying, and it's how they're saying it, and you would have said it differently, and then, well, I don't know if that's the exact context, and blah, 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 and oh, the, the speaker system isn't working right, and I mean, you're just in such a critique mode, it pulls you right out of what God's trying to do with you. That's where it gets bad, right? When you just become like hypercritical of things. So I think a better question of am I or are you skeptical or analytical? I think the question is why. Why are you being that way right now? What's your, what's your motivation? Motivation really, really matters to me. Now, if you are skeptical to know and own the truth, we're good. Because what that means is, if you're presented with something you did not know, you will adjust your viewpoint. If it's legit, right? That's a great reason to be analytical. However, there's a couple problems with that. What if we are only analytical and critical because we're afraid of being foolish? That's not a good reason. Where you're always like, man, I knew there was a problem with them. I called it out first. Nobody can pull one over on me. I'm always going to figure out what's wrong with the church before it disappoints me. Like, that's not good. That's not healthy. What about if we're just being analytical or critical just because we're a critical person of other people? We're always looking for where they're at fault so we can feel better about ourselves, yes. right? It's kind of like whenever you hear somebody that's smart, you're like, well, I got to figure out how, where areas they're stupid so I feel better and I feel more smart, <laughs> right? I mean, that's messed up, but we keep doing it. Yeah. What if it's, we're being critical or analytical simply because we have to be right all the time? I mean, that's an issue, is it not? Where you're, we're prideful, and so what we're trying to do is figure out, is there an area where I can be better and know more, right? Or are we just stubborn? Like deep in our heart, we're just stubborn. We are resistant in our spirit. I don't know if stubborn is more of a personality thing or if it's a heart-focused thing, right? Here's the fill-in-the-blank on the sheet in front of you or on your app online. Stubbornness stifles opportunity. Stubbornness stifles opportunity. Biblical stubbornness is called hard-heartedness. It means that hearts are resistant to what the Lord wants to do in us and through us. The definition of hard-hearted means to be rendered insensitive. And people are like, well, what's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong with that. The problem with being insensitive is that the Holy Spirit tends to be gentle 
and subtle. Hearing the voice of God is usually a skill set built on sensitive listening to internal thoughts, images, and impressions. In other words, discerning the voice of God, the actions of God, which is our main focus in the year of opportunity, is entirely based on being sensitive to God. Hard-heartedness will miss it every time. You will emerge out of this year unchanged because you blew past every opportunity. Because you figured you already know enough, you're all done growing. As I said, we're gonna need all the time for our passage and we're gonna be studying what happens when hard-heartedness goes into practicality. Is it possible to miss God? And that's a scary truth, that's a scary realization. So we always need to be self-aware. Would you turn with me to Mark chapter two? Mark chapter two, if you don't have a Bible, There should be one under the seat in front of you, but it's page 837. It really helps to look at it while I'm reading through it. That way you can tell what I'm adding and what is right there in black and white. Mark chapter two, page 837. Before we move forward, I think we all should appreciate how much Pastor Heather crushed it last weekend, yeah? I was so, so blessed by her. Now, I had the opportunity of being behind the scenes and walking with her in that journey. I got to see the intense weeks of preparation. I got a chance to see the commentaries examine, the theology examine, the cross-referencing, the making sure everything is in context, the ability to understand the background times. I watched all that hard work, and so I knew it was gonna be legit biblical. What I was most interested when I got to hear her preach was, what is the Holy Spirit going to sound like coming through her unique voice? That was what I wanted. And I was so blessed because what I got a chance to do is hear something. Now, you guys got to understand, I go to church here. I'm my own preacher. So I kind of hear it the same way quite a bit. Sometimes I disagree with that guy. Right? Right? So when I get a chance to hear another voice, when I get a chance to hear a unique way of hearing the Holy Spirit breathe out in our congregation, I heard something that I wouldn't have said it that way. And it was beautiful. Does that make any sense? Because what it did is I just need more of my Jesus. And so with all the unique voices that I hear, I'm hearing a little bit more about my Lord, right? And so there were some powerful ways that that things were said. And what she was sharing with us, if you haven't heard it, you gotta go back. It's amazing. What she was sharing was a famous story about a paralyzed guy that four friends brought him to Jesus to be healed. There was no room in the house. They lowered him down through the top. That's it. But what she was challenging us to do was consider whether or not we need to expand the group of people we interact with. We're very narrow, very tunnel vision. We tend to hang out with people that are just like us. We've got to expand that. Jesus hung out with with Romans. He hung out with Samaritans. He hung out with Jews. He hung out with women. He hung out with men. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners. He hung out with a ton of people because his idea was, I'm willing to love on everybody and I'm willing to influence for the kingdom of God whoever's in front of me. I'm not going to allow bias. I'm not going to allow ethnicity divides. I'm not going to allow gender weirdness to ruin my ability to spread the gospel. Amen? And so what she was saying was, listen, we're better together. We're stronger together. Christianity is more of a we faith than a me faith. That's what she was talking about. And so what she did was kind of in what you would call encourage your spirit, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and just tear that down, if that's, if that's cool. Uh, my, my, my message is all about conviction. Uh, everything I'm gonna be talking about is you're gonna feel terrible about yourself, but we're gonna have fun doing it, and we're gonna be laughing, going, oh, I got kicked in the head, ha, 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 ha. It's gonna be awesome, so let, why don't we go ahead and dive right into it. Mark chapter two, verse 18. Mark chapter two, verse 18. Now, John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to Jesus, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. 
The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Let's stop and talk about it. This is a Yoda story. Okay, so every time I'm reading the Bible and I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about right now. Like, I feel like you're on a different planet. That, that is when Jesus moves into Yoda mode, right? And you're like, hey, can you just tell me what you're trying to tell me? Because I feel really ignorant right now, right? And so I'm like, I would love to agree with you. I just don't know what you're saying. Okay, so real quick, I just got to train us uh, culturally, right? So there's Christianity and then there's church culture. Those are not the same things. So let me give you a little bit of a help here. When the pastor says something you don't understand, but you think it's deep, here's what you do. You just go, hmm. (laughs) Now, if you're feeling a little bit extra, here's what you do. You bow your head a little bit and raise your hand. (laughs) That's all you do. That means pastor, oh, that was big. That was big. I'm with you. You weren't with me. You have no idea what I just said. But everyone around you is like, oh my gosh, they're so holy. Yeah. Okay. So this is all I'm trying to tell you. It's all about appearances, people, right? Not about the change of the heart. Okay. What the? Okay. The, 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 you end up, you know, it's so funny, all these different things that we're like, and if you're really extreme, throw out a hallelujah. You don't even know what you're agreeing to. Hallelujah, pastor. You go. Whatever you just said, I don't know what you said. Anyway. So we, the disciples weren't fasting, and, and the other guys were. So what's fasting? Fasting is not eating for a religious purpose. And the Pharisees, who were like the more extreme group, they actually fasted every Monday and Thursday of every week from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And they did so as kind of an outward show of religiosity because they believed that if you fasted more, you were more spiritual, you were closer to God. And so John the Baptist's disciples has also fasted, but all of a sudden they look around, they're like, man, everybody's trying to be super spiritual, but why is Jesus's crew not doing that? And he gives them an analogy. But what's so weird about it is the question they asked, I don't think they wanted to know the answer. I actually think they wanted to start a fight. Have you ever asked a question just to start a fight, right? Like if you go, if you go, why did you put the forks in with the stabby side up in the dishwasher? Okay, you don't care. You're not asking for their viewpoint on forks and loading the dishwasher in cleanliness. You're trying to start a fight, right? You're saying, I don't like you doing that. Don't do it, right? But then we couch it in a question. I feel like that's what they're doing here. They're like, why are you guys doing that? Well, they're just trying to start a fight, but Jesus is interested in opening up everybody's understanding, so he answers the question. And he throws out this analogy about a wedding feast. And I'm like, do the original people get it? Like, if I'm really struggling with it, right? I'm an educated person. Were they struggling with it? The answer to that is kinda. Because we have two challenges. We have understanding the analogy and then what it means for us. I think they didn't uh, struggle with the first part at all. He was using such common stuff. He's like, hey, you guys, it's kind of like a wedding thing. They're like, oh, yeah. Then they can move on to the meaning. We are 2,000 years later, totally different culture. We got to do our homework, back up, figure out what the analogy was. Then we can apply it to our lives or not, right? Okay, so here's the background on all of this stuff. Jesus tells parables for what reason? Because a story is a world of information, not one specific point. If you tell someone a story of truth, they will reflect on a bunch of different aspects of it. If they want to know more, they go to the storyteller and ask questions, which creates relationship. That's what Jesus was doing. When he says it's a wedding thing, here's what they knew and we don't. When our folks get married in the Western world, I'm gonna suggest this is still the case in the Middle East and Eastern cultures today, but it was even more so in the ancient world. When they got married, it was a whole community thing. When in the West, when we have our folks get married, we immediately assume they're going to go away, right? So you call it a honeymoon. And what it means is, hey, we saw you guys just get married, and then we literally wave as they drive away, right? Because you're going, oh, you're starting your life together, you guys probably wanna be alone. In that culture, totally the opposite. The whole family saved up all their money 
to invite family, friends, community for a week-long party at their house. The couple doesn't go anywhere. All their best friends hang out in the living room, everybody crashes together, and they just enjoy laughing, joking, screwing around, hanging out, having food, drinking the whole week. That's a long party. I feel like on the third day, you're just like, dude, you're not funny. I like, <laughs> right? <laughs> like now that it's morning, you're kind of lame, actually. Anyway, so they all hang out together. The people that are the closest, because you can't have the whole community in your house, the people that are closest to you that get to stay with you are called children of the bride chamber. And so Jesus is like, hey, we all know this is how it goes. So he grabs that analogy and he's like, hey, so imagine this, right? We all have these parties, these week-long parties where we all hang out. And he's like, imagine I'm the groom and my crew, that's my buddies that hang out with me in the party. Would it make any sense to fast at a party? No, that just sounds stupid. Why would you do that? Because fasting tends to be this idea that things are wrong, so I'm now crying out to God in desperation. I need him to hear my hurt and respond. That's what fasting indicates. Why would you do that at a party? You wouldn't. It doesn't make any sense. Fasting says a thing is wrong. A party says, let's focus on what's right. So you wouldn't ruin the party by going, man, I'm just gonna not eat, I'm gonna fast, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it. That's not how it works. He's like, so of course you wouldn't do that. And his whole point is, it's inappropriate. It doesn't match. And so his idea that he's trying to, to, to try to tell them is he was like, listen guys, it makes sense for the Pharisees to fast because they're still waiting for the Messiah to show up. They're going, man, our world is terrible and we need a deliverer. It makes sense for the John the Baptist disciples to fast because they're not quite sure I'm the guy, so they're still waiting for the Messiah to show up. But my team knows I'm the Messiah and when they cried out for help, I showed up. And if I'm here, what are you waiting for? I'm here. So no, of course not. And it says, well, when the bridegroom is taken away, that only simply means when we go back to regular life, after the party is over and everybody splits up and goes their own way, then we get back to regular thinking and going, God, I need you. Jesus is telling them in a veiled way, listen, I'm not gonna be with you the whole time. After our three-year ministry, I'm gonna get out. And then you're gonna go back to regular life and you're gonna be calling for my return. You're gonna want me to come back and that's when you're gonna fast again. But while I'm with you, everything's right. There's no point in fasting. That's all it meant. But here's the deeper meaning, why he told that story. Here's the interesting thing. It is totally inappropriate for Jesus' team to know that he's the Messiah and not celebrate. If God did respond to their cry, can't we celebrate the answer and not just long for more? Yeah? Okay, then he drops a couple more analogies. Here we go, verse 21. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it. The new from the old and the worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins but new wine is for fresh wineskins. Okay, so here's what he's saying. He's saying, guys, none of us are rich around here. We all have to repair our clothes. We can't just go buy new clothes. So when we get a tear, we patch it, right? Everybody remember the rules of sewing? Everyone's like, yeah. Okay, now for our purposes, I need a quick show of hands. How many of you remember iron-on patches on jeans? Raise your hand. Yeah, all right, old people, way to go. Now, here's the thing. So I grew up, we didn't have a lot of money. My mom would iron on patches onto, it was always my knees. Here's the weird thing. After the age of 10, apparently I stopped crawling everywhere. Why was I always ruining my knees? I feel the need to slide everywhere. After 10, I haven't slid for a really long time. You're like, well, look at your pants. Now, I bought these off a nine-year-old kid in the playground. I didn't make these holes. Somebody else made these holes. That's not mine. Right? So he's like, hey, when you get holes in your knees, here's how it works. Like, your jeans 
are already all either shrunk and then stretched out and then they've kind of weathered. So when you put a brand new denim patch on them, he's like, it has to go through that same process. It's probably gonna shrink initially. What that does is the rest of the jeans are like, yeah, I'm, I'm done stretching, right? All of a sudden it goes whoop and it shrinks and it pulls at the seams and tears it open again. He's like, that's all I'm trying to tell you. You're like, oh, okay, I, I totally get that. So what, what does that have to do with me? He's like, well, here's the deal. Be mindful to match the materials. New with new, old with old. And we go, okay, I, yeah, I, I got that. What, but, but what's the deep? Oh, here you go. The new covenant and reality of Jesus coming to earth is so radically new that if you tried to merge the two realities of the old covenant and new covenant and try to use Jesus as an add-on to the old, it would make the situation worse, it would create a bigger hole that could never be filled, and everything will come apart. That's a powerful story. He's like, let's talk about wine. He's like, man, we all got wine in our house, that's kind of how it works, why? Because our water is suspect, right? You have a bit of the not great parts of Mexico effect going on here, and you can't just drink the water whenever you want, it's got little buggies in it, right, and it'll, it'll mess you up. So what they would do is that they would have wine, kind of a diluted wine mixture in their house because the fermentation process kills the buggies, right? So then they're like, all right, well, you can just drink the wine. It's kind of an everyday beverage. It wasn't the idea of getting drunk. It was just an everyday beverage. He's like, all right, so we all, you guys don't buy it at the store. We're all making it, right? Everybody makes it in their own house so they know how it works. Well, bottles aren't a thing. So he's like, listen, when we're making it, and how we carry it around has to be the same thing. So we need to put it in some type of container that can expand with it in its processes, but then we can carry it around. They're called wine skins. What has some give to it, but leather, right? So animal skins, that's kind of how it worked. Quick show of hands, how many of you remember in the 80s that, that leather pouch that would hang around your neck and had a screw on it? Anybody remember that? Yeah, what the heck was that thing about? Why were we such alcoholics we had to carry it around our neck? It's like a human St. Bernard problem. It just seems so strange, right? All right, same concept is that you had a leather thing. Now, here's why. Because all wine is transformed grape juice. And, and this is how it works. The process called fermentation actually comes from the Latin word that means bubbles, okay? So here's how it works. The sugars are converted to ethyl alcohol, and you do this by adding a form of bacteria to the grapes, and as it chemically transforms, it puts off CO2 gas, looks like it's bubbling, the gas pushes outward with pressure, and if the container doesn't have any more give, it will rupture and explode. That's all he said. He's like, yeah, you guys, you all know that's how it works. So if you have an older container that you've emptied, don't pour new stuff into it, it needs more give, and that thing is given all it can give. Make sense? New wine, new wine skins. Okay, what's the point? The new covenant and reality of Jesus coming to earth is so radically new that it actually breaks the old mold and renders the old ways inappropriate. Trying to fit Jesus into the sacrificial system would break everything. It's not gonna work and it's gonna make a mess. That's it. So we're left with the question, are we too old to change? And you and I know dang well it has nothing to do with chronological age, right? In my ministry, I have 84 and 86 year olds that are more soft in the hands of God than 20 year olds. I have people that are growing their entire lives. And that's what I wanna be. I wanna be somebody that until I'm in glory, I'm always in the process of transformation. I wanna always be changing, always be changing, always be changing. But if you have already changed enough, God can't use you for fresh work. He's gotta use you for old school stuff, right? Why? Because all change requires flexibility. Too often we don't wanna change because we live at max. We don't have any more cushion. We don't have any margin for change. Many times we're resistant because our lives are too filled. Maybe we never healed from the past, so we have scars and wounds, and those are taking up too much room. Sometimes we receive so much praise for our old answers we had, we don't want to be ignorant again and start over. And we are done changing. 
The only problem with that is it all means less connection to God. As I was reflecting on this and writing the message, I was thinking to myself, I always wonder why God spaces out revivals. You know what I mean? Like, why not just have a revival every 10 years? I think that would be pretty sweet. Everybody would be kind of fired up. Holy Spirit rolls in, big change. And then I was thinking, wow, maybe it's because the change process is so hard that he needs to let the last generation leave the earth before he can do another one. I don't know. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. I don't know. But it's something we're thinking about because I thought of this analogy. Imagine, if you will, being, I would say, 25 or older in the 60s and 70s. Now, I want you to imagine this when you're like, boy, I did that. Okay, great. The rest of us, we're going to imagine, right? <laughs> Y'all lived through it, and I'm about to talk about your experience, all right? The rest of us, we're going to imagine. Imagine that you're not really into this new hippie movement. As a matter of fact, the hippies are pretty flat out gross. Like, you look at them, and you're like, man, what is wrong with you? Does anybody not work anymore? What the heck? Now, all of a sudden, what? You guys are all wandering around. Oh, I can't possibly have a job, right? And you're like, oh, man, you're gross. You smell. What the heck's with your hair? What is going on with your hair? And then you're just like, oh, you're going to drop acid. Okay, now you're a bigger idiot than you were before, right? <laughs> like, you weren't smart at the beginning, and now you just made it worse. And now you're just like, oh, I'm going to hitchhike everywhere. Okay, cool, cool. You know, oh, I'm going to carry a sign. That makes you somehow important. Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, now it's free love, free sex, free disease. You know, and you're just like, man. <laughs> you're like, I, I don't like any, any part of this, right? And then, while you're being all bitter, God does a revival in that group. And you're like, come on! <laughs> right? Because all of a sudden, in that movement, in, the, in that people group, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts lighting up. And he's like, boom, boom, boom. And they start getting saved and, they're, and it's a mess and it's transformative. If you guys have seen the movie Jesus Revolution, that's a very sanitized version of what it looked like. There was a lot more angst, a lot of more anger, a lot more terrible times. Why? Because it wasn't just, man, you're messing up the church here. You know, you're messing up our carpet. There was a lot of that. Here was the bigger problem. Oh, you're going to let them in church. What, that means you affirm their drug use? You never told them that they couldn't bring the, you know, couldn't stop doing drugs before they came in. You're in inviting them in the mess that they're already in. You're inviting them with all kinds of crazy ideas. You're not addressing any of the main issues. And now you're just allowing them to sit in church. They're taking up space. And I don't even think they're serious about that. Right? And then after a while, you began to see God was doing it because upon reflection, it was the last greatest revival in America. And the only reason some of you are here in the church today is because God called your name. And you were those people. Imagine not being one of those people and you finally got through the learning curve. And it was really hard for you because you couldn't reconcile how it could be right. And then God brings another revival up. It is my opinion that the next greatest revival is going to happen in the LGBTQ community. What are you going to do? Right? Oh my gosh, now all of a sudden I don't understand and then uh, it's floating into the churches and everybody's connected and oh, what are you saying and how are you affirming and what does that mean and you're, you know. And then what? Have you done too much? Are you too exhausted? You don't have the stretch? You can't figure it out? You, don't, you can't have the compassion? You can't, have, can't walk with people? You can't understand the confusion? can't walk through the mess because you're so burnt out out of last time. I wonder why that's why God hasn't spaced them out the way he spaces them. Because man, revival, we all long and pray for revival. I'll tell you what, revival is exhausting. It is split churches. It splits families. It's tough. So once again, what are you going to do? Because I'm telling you right now, I'm all about it, right? Let's bring it, let's go. Because here's the deal, if I want real ministry, I want real mess, amen? amen? Amen, praise God. If God's in it, I'm in it, let's go. All right. Let's pick it up in verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as the team made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain to eat. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look at what they're doing. Why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? 
And Jesus said to them, have you never read what David did in 1 Samuel 21 when he was in need and was hungry? He and those along with him. He entered the temple, the house of God, in the time of Ahimelech the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for anyone to eat but the priests, and also gave some to his team that were with him. Now, this is where Mark stops of Jesus' speech. Matthew adds that Jesus told another story. And Jesus said, or have you not read in the law in Numbers 28 how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple, they profane the Sabbath every time, yet they're guiltless. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what the phrase meant, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned my men, the guiltless. Go to verse 27 in Mark. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. All right. Here's what he just did. He just brought up these analogies, some stories from the past, and dropped four truth bombs. Let's talk about it. It all got triggered when his guys are going through the field like this, and they're scooping up. So like a stalk of wheat or a stalk of barley would come up, and all the heads of grain are on the top. So you can actually, if it's tall enough, you can just scoop your hands, and you scoop it up, all the grain in, and you pop it in your mouth like, like popcorn. So you scoop it up and you throw it in. It's just raw and, you're, and it's, you know, you're able to have starches so it feels like it fills up your stomach. That's all you're doing, just walking through. Is what they were doing was illegal because they're in other people's lots. I mean, that's not their grain. So are they doing something illegal? The answer to that is no. Why? Because the Mosaic law had a mandate that anyone that had a field was not allowed to maximize profit. You are not allowed to use all your wheat. You had to leave some over for the poor. So what would happen is they leave it past and the people that can't really afford it, they come through and they pick up what they have just to be able to eat. That was the principle of Israel. So what they were doing was not wrong. The problem was the day they were doing it on. Now, the Sabbath has always been a big deal. From the very beginning of creation, God set a seven-day week, correct? As a matter of fact, we all remember it because he instituted this seven-day thing. He said, I created for six days, and on the seventh day, I rested. Now, what God was doing was what every good parent was doing, and that is lying. <laughs> now, here's why. God wasn't tired, right? Right? It's not like he was like, man, creating is super tough. Here's what happened. He was trying to institute it for us. So what he did is what every parent does when it's time to put your little kiddos to bed, right? You're like, hey, buddy, it's time to go night-night. Oh, I'm not tired. I know, but oh, I am. Oh, you're totally lying. What are you talking about, <laughs> right? And then you're like, oh, look at us. We're going to bed. Oh, we're all going to, oh, even daddy's going to bed. We're all going to bed. And he's like, well, this is stupid. I'm not gonna be up by myself, so I guess I'll go to bed. The minute he falls asleep, boom, you're up watching Netflix. Because <laughs> you're a liar. <laughs> you were never tired. Okay, so that's all God did is he was like, oh, creating, ooh. <laughs> oh, I gotta go night-night, right? And then everyone's like, yeah, and then they go night-night. Okay, that's all the Sabbath is, right? And so because he knew we'd be little workaholic freaks, he was man made it mandatory. Hey, stop it, no more working, bad, right? You don't work on the seventh day. And he put really serious restrictions on it so people would get in trouble if they didn't do it. He was doing it for our health, right? Because we perform for our identity. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You are not who you are because of what you perform and what you can do. You are who you are because of who I say you are. You are precious to me. Stop trying to earn who you are, right? A bunch of stuff like that. So along the way, the religious leaders were like, well, if God gets mad when somebody works on the seventh day, what if we make a bunch of rules so we wouldn't even get close to doing that? They backed it up and they started adding regulations. And it became absurd. So much so that the reason they were busting Jesus' disciples were this thing where you walk and scoop it up. They go, you're harvesting, you're working. Dude, I'm not harvesting, I'm scooping. They're like, you're harvesting, that's work, you're in trouble. Jesus is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You guys are way off base. 
Let me explain something to you because I don't think you're reading your Bibles. So first of all, you guys like David? They're like, yeah, we love King David. He's amazing. He's like, yeah. So anyway, do you remember his story? He's running away from King Saul. King Saul's trying to kill him. He has his team. They don't have any food. They don't have any water. They are desperate. They're like running. They had to go somewhere safe that would have compassion and would have food. They go to the temple. Ahimelech, the priest, he's like, hey, you guys, we just took the holy bread out of the place, gave God new bread. We're going about to eat that. You guys can have that bread. And they're like, oh my gosh, we can't eat that. That's only for priests. He's like, dude, it's better that you don't die Go ahead and eat the bread. We're fine. God has his bread. He said, you remember that story? Clearly, the rules adjust in the right circumstance. Side note, do you guys know about this whole bread, God likes bread thing? You guys know this? Okay, so the temple is the big holy building for the Jewish people, and there's a portion in it which is kind of like God's room. It's called the holy place. At the end of his room is a curtained off special area that would have like the Ark of the Covenant, and that was his actual presence, he would say, would allow it to dwell there. But in that other bigger area of the holy room, there was a bunch of stuff in there. The walls were like lined with gold, so it would shimmer. There was a big menorah in there that would shine really brightly, right? There was an incense altar that was always smoking before God so that it smelled really good. And every Sabbath, they would bring freshly baked bread in there and they put it on the showbread table. The showbread table is three feet long and it's a foot and a half wide and two feet tall. It's an acacia wood table overlaid with gold. So they would have it there and then they would do two stacks of six pieces of bread because their loaves are more unleavened so they're flatter than ours that are arcs, so you could stack them. Does that make sense? Now, here's something that you may not know. Whenever they switch out, four priests bring in new bread while four priests take out the old bread. But you always have to have bread in the place. So that's why you bring in new before you take out the old. And you're like, four priests? Man, these guys can't carry very much bread. (laughs) Right? You're like, I could totally handle it myself. Okay? The loaves are three feet long and seven inches wide. And they weigh five pounds a piece. And you got 12 of them. Why 12? 12 tribes of Israel. So these are massive. They're the length of the table. Sitting together, they take up the entire table. They're massive loaves, which makes sense because when they swap out the old stuff, the priests get to eat it. They're probably not going to eat the whole thing, so they might get rid of some of it. But they had already pulled it out, and David's team came in. That's a lot of bread for his guys. Does that make sense? It's not a little bit of bread. It's tons. Okay, great. So he said, and here's the other thing. Numbers 28 and just practical wisdom shows, oh, look, on the Sabbath, the temple's still open, right? Yeah? Who's working that? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I know. Priests work it every Sabbath. So clearly some people work on the Sabbath. Stop being so resistant. You're making it something it's not. Uh, It's so interesting to me because he starts bringing in all these analogies and he's like, guys, I don't think you're tracking on this. And then he just drops four truth bombs. One after another, if you combine Matthew and Mark's accounting, here's what he says. Number one, something greater than the temple is here. Those are fighting words. Because the Jewish people love the temple. The temple was not only beautiful, but it was an indicator that God chose them. It was an indicator that a portion of his presence would dwell with them. It was was an experience that they had his blessing, and that was a big pride thing for them. And Jesus walks up and he goes, I'm better than that. Whoa, 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 what are you talking about? Well, how do we look at it? You're excited because God heard you and a portion of his presence showed up? I'm all here. I showed up, I'm with you. You wanna talk about the presence of God, I'm right here. You wanna talk about being near, you wanna talk about being personal, you wanna talk about being chosen, you wanna talk about being blessed? What have I been doing since I've been here? Have I not blessed you? I'm better than that. That's simply an example of what I would be like. Second thing he says, if you had known the phrase, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you wouldn't be all over my guy's case. What does that mean? It means 
Stop being religious and being a jerk. I would rather you be a little less religious and sweeter. Like you keep, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. A lot of people do everything right religiously and they have hateful hearts. That's trash. It doesn't work. God's like, listen, forget it. I don't want your worship out of your mouths if your lives are hateful. Third thing he drops on them. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. They had made Sabbath into this all-encompassing, all-powerful external law. He goes, guys, the reason I started it was to care for you. It was never to hurt you. It was always to bless you. You turned it into a curse. Like you're making so many different rules and regulations, you're making it hard. It was supposed to refresh you. It's a time when you hang with friends, you hang with family, you soak in God. That's it. You rejuvenate. That's the point. But now you've made everything difficult. Lastly, he said, the Son of Man is even Lord of the Sabbath. Now, we know that's a veiled reference to him being the Messiah, but they wouldn't have heard that. They would have heard mankind is in charge of the Sabbath, not Sabbath in charge of mankind. Keep it a blessing. Don't let it slip. That was his point. In order to drive this entire point home, Mark includes this story. Go to chapter three, verse one. On another day, Jesus entered the synagogue and there was a man there with a withered hand. The Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with a withered hand, come on up here. And he said to the group, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life? or to kill it. Matthew says that Jesus told another story. Which of you who has a sheep, if he falls in a pit on the Sabbath, will not lift it out? How much of more value is a man than a sheep? It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Go back to Mark. At the end of verse four, it says, but the group was silent. Verse five, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and immediately his hand was restored. The Pharisees immediately went out and held counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. What a weird story. What the heck? This is all a setup. They knew Jesus was coming in. They grabbed the dude that had the withered hand, which meant everyone could see it from a distance. They knew that Jesus is a healer. They knew that he has a hard time walking by suffering. And they're like, let's sit them together in synagogue. Watch, because what's gonna happen is there's no way Jesus is gonna pass this opportunity. He's gonna heal him, but you can't heal on the Sabbath. What? Does that even make any sense? Here's why. It's work. The rules became so bizarre that you could only stop someone from dying, you can't help them get better. This is super bizarre. So let's say, for example, there's a car crash. Somebody is super messed up. You can cauterize and stop their bleeding, but the moment they're stable, you have to leave them till tomorrow because you're not allowed to benefit them. This is so weird. And Jesus is like, this is dumb. I'm not doing that. So he's like, dude, come here for a second. And he calls him right up front. He's like, you guys are super sneaky, right? I already know what you're doing. Let's just do this publicly. But before I talk to this guy, real quick question for the group. Is the Sabbath for killing people? Everyone's like, no. Oh, okay, just checking. Here's the deal. Another question for you guys. So if you were like inside watching TV and you heard your little lamb go, and it just fell down a hole. And it's like, are you seriously just going to ignore it? Or are you not going to go out there and pick it up? Well, we'd probably pick it up. I know! So I'm trying to tell you, if you would do that to an animal, why wouldn't you do that to a human? I'm looking and I'm seeing suffering right in front of me. You think I'm not going to do it. Of course I'm going to do something. Hey, dude, stretch out your arm. It gets healed right there. You would assume everybody would be like, oh, dang! Like, oh, the Messiah's here! They're like, this guy's got to die. <laughs> what? What kind of reaction is that? And those two groups, the Herodians and Pharisees, they never get along. The only time they get along is when they have a common enemy, Jesus. 
Is it possible that somebody could come to church with such a bad attitude they miss the whole thing that God's doing? Is it possible that we would reject a miracle because we don't like the vehicle it came in? What's stubbornness doing to us? What's hard heartedness doing to us? In a year of opportunity, we're gonna miss it all. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is the plan. But if you already know everything, I guess we got nothing for you. Remember, church is a place where we go to grow. Church is a place where we go to be challenged. We don't go to church to be reaffirmed you're brilliant. That's not what church is for. Church is to be changed in the image of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. That's why it's a high challenge environment. That's why there's a constant, hey man, how about we assess this? What about this? Maybe we should change this. Because for the rest of our lives, we are clay in the potter's hand. And he has a lot of adjustments to make because this form worked during this decade, but this form needs to work for this decade. He's doing some adjustments. So I want you to listen to these three statements and see if they resonate in your heart. Statement number one, religiosity ruins a right response. Religiosity ruins a right response. Number two, stubbornness stifles the spirit. Stubbornness stifles the spirit. Number three, hard hearts hamper transformation. Hard hearts tra hamper transformation. Here's the fact, y'all. God is doing a new thing at Bridgeway. Things that we have sown for the last 10, 20 years are coming to fruition now, and God's on the move. Uh, Holy Spirit is creating a whole massive tidal wave that we're just trying to ride with him. And I'm telling you this, if you don't have new wineskins, you're gonna break. If you are not ready to stretch and grow and learn. You guys, tonight, we are closing out a politics series, Christianity and American Politics. You think that was easy? You think that makes everybody feel good? You think that's how you make friends? No. We did it because it was necessary to get our eyes back on Jesus Christ. So we did this series. I mean, man, it's crazy. Do you think we agitated folks? Yes, we did. It's not easy. It's a challenging environment. But the whole point is, is that we can grow together, that we can see something that's higher, that we can begin to say, listen, politics aren't the solution. Jesus is the solution. That our problem is not somebody across the aisle, it's sin. Yes. And until we figure that out, we don't need more brilliant policies. We need more Holy Spirit to try to transform in hearts. Yes. But that's not popular today. That's not, everybody gets mad because it's not taking sides and we're not gonna yell and try to curse the other team and blah, blah, blah. Listen, we don't do that. And so I'm asking you, if you're in this environment with us, we're growing together, we're learning together, we're stretching together. You guys, it's not easy for any of us, but I think there's more. And until our hearts are wholly his, we're gonna keep growing, amen? amen. I'm gonna have the prayer team come on up here. Let's close this thing out. Thank you for just being with me and studying the word of God. I believe this is a precious time, amen? amen? Prayer team, come on up here. If you need prayer after the service, they're gonna be here for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure love you that we are in your house, God. Your rules apply. Whatever you don't like, God, we will adjust. And so, Lord, right now, I know there's probably a ton of things that I'm doing wrong. There's probably a ton of stuff I don't see right but I never will be more than what you make me. So God, I just pray for my friends today, my family today right here, listening online everywhere, Lord, that you would just help us to be soft in your hands so we can grow with you. We don't wanna miss a bit. Everything that is you, God, we're gonna be remained anchored in your word. We're gonna remain anchored in true theology. But God, there's a lot of areas we gotta clean up. So I just pray that you would give us eyes to see. Give us a spirit of unity as we run forward. Help us to back each other up, not tear each other down. And Lord, would you make this place something beautiful as an offering for you? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a wonderful weekend.